Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. For the past 15 years, we have had a focus through the support of the club on out of the box information on cancer. We well know that when someone has a cancer diagnosis, there's fear, and we hope to replace that with hope. We've had a number of different programs over these years for information that's difficult to find. Dr. Moss is an icon in his field. If you look up the words, oh goodness gracious, how do I possibly describe you? If you look up the words committed, courageous, conviction, you will see Dr. Moss's name next to them. At a time decades ago when finding information about cancer was impossible to, to know how to really support yourself, Dr. Moss was a trailblazer. He has been here for us for decades and Dr. Moss, I am so incredibly grateful that you made the time in your busy schedule to be here with us today. At the end of this program, I'll announce upcoming programs and I'm gonna give you a very short bio on Dr. Moss because I could take up the whole program discussing that. He's been writing about alternative and complementary cancer treatments since the 70s. At the National Institute of Health, he co-founded what became the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Make no mistake, that is one of the United States most important medical arms for research. And Dr. Moss was one of the co-founders at the very, very beginning. He has produced four films, 12 books, the Moss Report podcast, which I encourage everyone to get. Uh, it's on Spotify and it's on the Apple, Apple uh, sourcing. 38 diagnosed based Moss reports for cancer, which can also be found on his website. He has a free film, again, I encourage you to go there to mossreports.com called The Battle Within. It, he also has a new book where you can get a free ebook called uh, Cancer Incorporated. I will let you take over the program now, Dr. Moss, and thank you once again for being here. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. So my topic today is promising immunotherapies for cancer from the blacklist to the Nobel Prize. Um, and may we have the first slide, please? <clears throat> so the, I start a long time ago in about the turn of the 14th century. Uh, there was a, a man, he was a, um, a monk and a priest uh, named Peregrine Lazioli. And he lived from 1260 to 1345. Uh, in the town of Forli, Italy, in the center of Italy. And he was a friar in the Order of Servants of Mary. And around 1320, he developed some kind of tumor or lesion on his leg. They were going to amputate his leg. And uh, just before that happened, uh, the tumor spontaneously resolved. So um, the word spontaneous uh, is a kind of peculiar word because it kind of implies that there's no cause or it's something that happened through, through prayer or some sort of psychic intervention. Nobody knows, of course, six, 700 years later what exactly happened, but the man no longer had that problem. And the rumor of this, the word of this spread throughout Europe and then throughout the world. And he became the literally the uh, Catholic Church patron saint of cancer and other so-called incurable diseases. And his body is still resting there in the Basilica of Forley. And they, they've pulled up the um, uh, pant leg to show the public that there's no sign of any cancer there. So regardless of what we think, you know, really happened to him or whatever his, his illness was, uh, clearly, the man went on and lived another, um, you know, a couple of decades uh, without any sign of cancer. So this brings up the topic of the spontaneous remission of cancer. And um, uh, there is a uh, there is a long history of trying to understand what the 
physical basis of these quote unquote miraculous or uh, unexpected cures was without medical intervention. Um, many people wrote about this and there was some interest, as, especially if you yourself ex experienced this in yourself or in one of your patients, let's say, the person who probably moved the field along the most in, uh, in the 20th century was Warren Cole. And Warren Cole wrote, uh, wrote a whole, co-authored a whole book about the phenomenon of spontaneous remissions and established that it really did happen, that it wasn't uh, just a, a myth as many people thought. And he said, the body's defense forces are mobilized against cancer what we need to learn, therefore, is how to mobilize this force when cancer strikes. And since he was the president of the American College of Surgeons and also the president of the American Cancer Society, his words carried a great deal of weight and gave impetus to try to find what those, what those internal forces were, the body's own defense forces. Um, the, the, we, we, we move forward then. Uh, to the story of, of William B. Coley and the Coley's toxins. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation about this, but basically uh, William B. Coley was a, a top uh, up and coming surgeon at uh, what's now Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is I, where I got my start as a science writer in the seventies. But um, he, he was there from the, uh, early 1890s and he died in, he retired in 33 and he died in 1936. And this is very, very important. This is sort of the, the linchpin, if you will, of the whole immunotherapy, immunology story that we tell in our, our film that Adria uh, referred to, which is immunotherapy, the, the battle within. So the battle within is the battle within the person between the cancer and the immune system. It's also the battle within medicine, within, within science itself over how to best approach the cancer problem. And Coley was a, um, was a young surgeon and he was treating the, um, uh, the girlfriend of John D. Rockefeller Jr. And she, he, had, he operated on her for her sarcoma of her arm. And despite everything that his chief, uh, Dr. Bull, and many others had told him, uh, the woman, the girl, or young woman, uh, had a recurrence of her cancer and died. And this shook him to his foundations because he suddenly, as a young surgeon, realized that there were cases where there, were no, there was no apparent cancer, and yet the cancer came back and quickly uh, uh, killed her. And incidentally, it also changed uh, the John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his descendants, who then became very pro prominently involved in the fight against cancer and in Memorial Sloan Kettering in particular. Uh, Coley um, was, I want to go on here, and, and Coley uh, determined to try to find at least one case of somebody who was cured medically of this, um, of this kind of sarcoma or uh, connective tissue cancer and uh, went at, at John D. Rockefeller's uh, Jr.'s urging, he went through all the records of New York Hospital and the other big hospitals that were available to him to try to find a cure and Eventually, he found a case in the records of a man named Fred K. Stein, a German refugee, and he, uh, the man had had three or four recurrences of a head and neck cancer, which had been operated on by Dr. Bull, um, but had recurred. And the last time it recurred, he was sort of at the point of death, and he he um, contracted a case of what's called erysipelas. Erysipelas was a, um, a fairly common uh, skin disease caused by a strep infection, streptococcal infection. And he went looking through the tenements of New York and he finally located Mr. Stein. And this was years later, seven years later, and the man was completely cured. 
still remained cured of his cancer. So Coley got the idea that he could infect people with erysipelas to try to see if he could reproduce what the successful treatment of Mr. Stein. Uh, over time, they had to stop giving live erysipelas germs. Instead, they came up with a killed formula uh, called Coley's toxins or Coley's fluid. And here you can see headlines in the New York Times uh, dated 1908, erysipelas germs as cure for cancer. Uh, Dr. Coley's remedy of mixed toxins makes one disease cast out the other, meaning erysipelas or streptococcus cast out the cancer. Many cases cured here. And he says physician has used the cure for 15 years and treated 430 cases, probably 150 sure cures. This is all correct. This is, it is absolutely factual, uh, factually correct. Um, and then we have some other, um, other newspaper articles that appeared around that same time. Doctors Bull and Coley make an important clinical discovery. They had set up tents on the lawn of the old Memorial Hospital up on 104th Street in Central Park West. And they were treating people in these tents because they didn't want to expose the other patients to the germs of the erysipelas. Um, so over time, though, uh, a, a number of things occurred that kind of prevented the treatment from being uh, widely adopted. Uh, some of the problem was in the preparations themselves. This is formed from living organisms. So there was great variability in the strength and the potency and the, and the ability of these different preparations. But especially in the, the, for the last part of the 19th century, there was a great deal of success using the Coley's toxins in treating cancers that would be very difficult to cure today using you know, all our modern methods of treatment. So if this was a, a, a very important uh, development. Um, I'll return to this question about the Coley's toxins very, sh uh, very shortly. But in Europe, there were also many important developments going on. Now, this discovery of the effect of erysipelas on cancer, the beneficial effect, had actually been made a few years before Coley uh, by a couple of European uh, doctors, Dr. Bush and Phelanstein uh, independently had discovered this. And in fact, in the writer Anton Chekhov's um, diary, there's a reference to the fact that uh, erysipelas cures cancer. So I think it was pretty widely known and understood. The best research, most important, was done by uh, two uh, doctors who are today for pretty much forgotten, Ernst Freund and uh, his assistant, uh, Giza Kaminer, at the University of Vienna. And they anticipated a lot of the aspects of modern immunology, in particular, they discovered that there were certain cancer dissolving factors in normal blood, but this, if they then injected or subjected the uh, cells uh, to the serum from cancer patients, that there were blocking factors that protected the cancer cells from destruction or what they called the destructive elements in normal serum. So here you see the first inkling of an understanding that there were such things as blocking factors that were being produced, we would now say, by the tumor. This is very similar. You'll see, we'll pick up this, this thread again very, uh, very shortly to the idea behind immune checkpoint inhibitors because these immune checkpoints um, are factors produced by mainly by the cancer that can uh, effectively block the immune system. So I think... That's what they were looking at. Um, we don't know for sure. This is the only picture I ever was able to find of, uh, of Dr. Freud and Kamen or Kamen are being uh, off to his right. He's looking in the microscope there. Um, they had a very sad fate. They both were Jewish and they fled the Nazis, you know, when the Nazis took over uh, Vienna and she died in London shortly thereafter. He died a few years later and their work was pretty much forgotten. But look at this. This is... Um, from Time Magazine, 1924. And here's that, what they said, that they had found a substance which added to the serum of normal people, changed it to resemble the serum of people with cancer. So this was not exactly, it was hiding in plain sight, basically. 
but for various reasons we we, we can't we don't have time to go into this too sort of fell by the wayside um, and nobody can to my knowledge connected Freud and Kaminer's research with that of Coley but they're obviously uh, to me at least they're obviously related so decades passed and um, but there, there wasn't much activity uh, on that front and the world was turning to other things, especially radiation and chemotherapy in very early stages of chemotherapy research. And um, Coley died in 1936 and his, he had a country house in Connecticut and his, he left it to his daughter, Helen, um, and uh, I presume also to her, to her brother, Bradley, and she went up to, uh, to the house to clean, sort of clean it out. And she discovered this amazing treasure trove of documents in the barn where like all his correspondence of, with like a thousand different people that around the world um, was contained in there. So she was, she was a, a, a high school graduate and, and uh, a housewife, a mother, and uh, uh, I think she did some work as a landscape architect, you know, a designer, but no serious, no particular interest in, in science, much less in cancer. But she started to read these documents and she got the idea of uh, in the late 30s of writing a biography of her father. And she pursued this as she got into it. She had a, a revelation that. William B. Coley actually was able to cure cancer in some very advanced cases. And this had, uh, you know, that was not her interest and it has uh, sort of escaped her notice, but she realized that she was sitting on the document, a lot of the documentation of that fact, because it's an astonishing fact. The idea that people were being cured of cancer in the 1890s, you know, isn't exactly common knowledge. And so she pursued the idea of, of, documenting what William B. Coley had achieved. And she wound up <clears throat> um, teaming up with, um, well, she was co completely rejected by Memorial Sloan Kettering and by Rockefeller University. I mean, they really undermined her attempt to do this. And a lot of it because she wasn't a scientist, she wasn't a certified scientist, she was a lay person. Um, so she started to team up with other people. Oliver Grace helped her co-found an institute, Cancer Research Institute, which still exists, a very fine organization in New York. Um, and she uh, started writing articles and monographs on Coley's work. And her first article appeared in, in 1945, uh, The Treatment of Malignant Tumors by Bacterial toxins as developed by the late William B. Coley. And this was co-authored with a physician acquaintance of hers, War, uh, Walker Swift, and her brother, Bradley Coley, who had taken over his father's uh, practice uh, in bone cancer and bone surgery. And, and from there, from there, uh, she did an incredible thing, something that is still, you know, completely unrecognized, I would say, a tremendous feat of intellectual prowess and, and achievement. She wrote 18 monographs, which are single subject books, um, and then numerous articles um, on just factually documenting the outcome of every case of treatment of Coley's toxins that that she was able to find, that she scoured the world for these cases. And she, in addition, documented hundreds of cases. There were about a thousand of those. And then she documented um, many, many hundreds of cases of people who had remissions of cancer after uh, an infection and or a fever, something like a streptococcal infection, similar, of course, to that first case of Red Case Stein. And she... She had many ups and downs, a mostly rejection, I would say. Um, but she also kept at it. She was, she, I knew her, and she was a incredibly dynamic, uh, determined person, a bit acerbic in her personality, a little bit, you know, you were a little bit scared if you went to her apartment on Park Avenue. And, uh, you know, she had very definite opinions, and most of those were opinions about, Coley's toxins, of course, but she knew 
more than anybody in the world. I think she knew more than Coley knew because she had the, you see, Coley was completely occupied in four different areas, trying to make a living and keep up a very high lifestyle. Um, Manhattan's ex it was always expensive place. And he was, you know, they were in the social register and he was trying to keep up appearances as it were. Co she was a bit more relaxed. She, she lived on the, on the poorer side of Park Avenue, above 96th Street, was considered the poor, the poor district. And she was able to sort of focus on this, concentrate on this. And the, what she came up with, I mean, in addition to documenting all the cases of, of um, successful and unsuccessful uh, treatment with Coley's toxins, she established the seven factors that led to a successful Coley treatment. Now, the interesting thing here is, look at number two, the initial immune competence of the patient. She was able to see statistically that people who were initially started out with a strong immune system uh, also would respond much better to the treatment. Um, this comes back. You'll see in a, in a future slide that I'm going to come to very shortly that this, um, this is the key, really, I think, or one of the keys, no single key, but this is a very important thing because it's the exact same finding from MD Anderson Cancer Center about the modern day immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, exact same point, how, you, how healthy and strong your immune system is uh, determines or predicts how well you're going to respond to immunotherapy. Common sense, but not very often uh, acted on by, by oncologists. So these were the seven, the seven factors. And when these were all aligned, barring cases of extreme uh, debility, people who were, you know, cachexia or, or wasting syndrome, barring, you know, advanced metastatic stage four, you know, debilitated patients, but people with potentially curable disease were oftentimes cured if you could line up these factors and get everything right. And um, that's a, a, an amazing finding because not, not that there is one, ever going to be one cure for cancer. That's a, you know, sort of a myth or a dream. But here we have a, a treatment, not expensive. Maybe the whole thing would cost about $1,500 or $2,000 to produce the drugs, uh, the, the Coley's toxins for an individual. And not really all that difficult to do or particularly toxic compared to most modern therapies, but she figured out where it would work and where it wouldn't work. And I think that's her greatest, aside from her, her general promotion and keeping Coley's idea alive. Now, that was her great achievement. So, so what was her reward for doing that? And this is one of the saddest chapters in the history of cancer. Her reward was to get put onto the quack list. The quack list was unproven methods of cancer management. At that time, uh, American Cancer Society had a, I would say, a near monopoly on dispensing information to the American public, at least, about cancer. And much of what they did is great. It's wonderful. They, they've saved many, many lives through their campaign against tobacco smoking and, and other things. So I'm not denigrating them as an organization. I'm just saying there was a portion of that organization <clears throat> that was quite destructive. And that was the Committee on Unproven Methods and the book Unproven, which was, which was a loose leaf book. I, the day, first day on my job at Sloan Kettering, which was June 3rd, 1974, for those who are keeping track of these things. Um, so it, it's, it, they handed me that book it had a different co uh, uh, cover on it, but it was essentially that book. So this was my guidebook because I was answering calls from the public uh, uh, concerning non-conventional treatments. There's quite a bit of interest. And I got in inherited a big folder from my predecessor um, in public affairs department on these different uh, questions people were asking. And I was supposed to go to the unproven methods of cancer management, look, read through that and give them an answer to tell them about these things. And here, there were all kinds of things. Uh, let's, you know, let's just be a little frank about this. I mean, some of these were pretty wacko um, and, and probably were, 
you know, you could probably justifiably call them uh, quackery, although it's a it's a nasty term. But you know what I mean. There there wasn't any scientific basis to just to a lot of these things. But then mixed in were some really outstanding treatments. And uh, Coley's led the list. Coley's was so out of place here. And, if, uh, you know, you know, if you read this this write up, it's just the most ridiculous thing, especially in retrospect, we can see. But I, I know my own I was uneasy, you know, when I would read this and read these other statements. But there it was. That was the official line that started in 1965 and it went on for a decade. So basically and there were other, by the way, other good complementary treatments, what we would now call complementary treatments included on that list, including hypothermia uh, and other things. So um, it went on for 10 years. And what happened is that during that time uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, Helen, who was just sort of um, pursuing her own crusade, to get her uh, to get her, especially after 65, to get her father and therefore her family off this quack list, which she took very personally. And, you know, I mean, here was a woman who was, you know, in the social register. Her father was one of the top four bone surgeons in the U.S., if not the world. And now they're suddenly vilified as quacks. So this was very personal to her and also scientifically outrageous. But she had this incredible good fortune to team up with a man named Lloyd J. Old, who was young. Lloyd was about, about uh, 25 or 26 when he came to Sloan Kettering as a researcher. Um, he already, as a medical student, had published the first article suggesting that an immune stimulant, in this case, B BCG, the standard, uh, back, uh, standard tuberculosis vaccine, could be used as tumor immunotherapy. And that was just the first of numerous discoveries that are uh, earth shaking. I mean, it's hard to believe that this man could have won the Nobel Prize five times over. And I think it was an in, uh, injustice. I don't know how and why that happened that he didn't get it. But, you know, if you look down the list, um, the CD family of antigens, which is so foundational to understanding the immune system today, discovery of P53, the one that touched me personally and that brought me into their orbit um, was the discovery of tumor necrosis factor. Not a household term, for most people, but believe me, there are there are more than a thousand researchers around the world uh, who are working on TNF, TNF alpha, TNF beta. Um, I, I just uh, in two thousand, I happened to be on another mission. I happened to be in Trondheim, Norway, and they were having a convention of TNF researchers. I wrote the first article for the public on TNF uh, as the science writer at Sloan Kettering, so I was very interested in this. I expected to, you know, see a group of maybe 20 researchers there. There were over a thousand, over a thousand people had, had come in, in the year 2000 uh, to, to Norway, to northern Norway, to attend a TNF conference. So I don't know how many there are today. There's probably, so, you know, several thousand people working on this. So this was huge, huge importance. And that came about, if you know the backstory, that came about through the investigation of Coley's toxins. So most of the cytokines like TNF, uh, TNF and interleukin and interferon, these have their roots in different attempts to understand the spontaneous remission of cancer and the Coley, Coley's toxin. So this was, this was a very, very important thing. She hooked up with, with Lloyd and here's um, a, a picture of the two of them together. And I called it, that's how Lloyd looked to me when I, when I knew him, I knew him at the end of his life also, uh, died in, uh, in 2011, but you know, that was him on the left, charismatic, handsome, uh, charming, 
cultured. You w- walked into his office, you expect, you know, most the artwork in most uh, scientists' office would be like a Dilbert cartoon or something. And he had a, po- a portrait of Mozart, beautiful portrait of Mozart on the wall in front of you as you walked in. And he had a couch and a, and a bookshelf. And it was, and he was very averse to publicity. Uh, I was, because I wanted to write about tumor necrosis factor, um, I managed to get into the inner sanctum, if you will. And he said something to me that completely changed my life. And it's the reason that I'm here today. The reason I can give you this perspective on development of immunotherapy is because of this, this moment, this interview I had with him in 70, 1975. And he said to me in the course of about an hour long discussion, he said, do you know, do you want to know where we get all our new ideas from? And of course, as a young science writer, I, not that I wanted to know more. <laughs> and he walked behind me and went to the bookshelf and took down a book and handed it to me. It was Unproven Methods of Cancer Management, the same book that I had in my office that I was using to discourage people from any interest in non-conventional treatments. He said, this is here. He said, this is, the, this is our Bible. So this, you know, this blew my mind. And I really, uh, you know, I really had to reorient everything that I was thinking because I was suspecting that amidst a lot of the dross that exists there, there were some gems and he was letting me know that that was fine. It was okay for me to pursue that line of inquiry and that line of thinking. So that, that absolutely changed my life. And they were, as you see, this is a lovely picture of the two of them together. Look at the way Helen is looking at him. She was so adoring of him and so appreciative because he saved her. He saved her and he saved the Coley phenomenon because uh, once he had the, he was, he, by the way, he was vice president at, at, at that age, at that young age, he was the one on the left. He was a vice president of Sloan Kettering Institute. So, you know, it, it, this was a big deal. And when he gave a, he gave a famous uh, lecture uh, in, uh, in the early 70s, um, he was invited to give uh, this famous lecture. And he included uh, one sentence about the Coley's toxins that people who have examined the cases know that basically in some cases it was effective. This was electrifying when he did that. I mean, it, it opened, it gave legitimacy, it opened the door to further research on this. So this was, this was kind of this coming together of these two individual, very different people in so many ways. I, I can't go into all of them. I talk about it a little bit at our film, uh, Immunotherapy, The Battle Within, which is at our web, our Moss Reports website. So now there's a, there were some other developments that I want to get on to the leading into immune, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, which is what most people think of now when they think of immunotherapy. And I can't mention this field without paying tribute to the, the Hellstroms. Hellstroms were a Swedish couple who were, uh, came to the U.S. and they were affiliated with the University of Washington uh, still, I think they're both still alive, if I'm not mistaken. They were, they had many different positions, never really, uh, you know, uh, Bob Good, who was uh, my other boss at Sloan Kettering, who was, who was the president of Sloan Kettering, certainly knew of their work and spoke very highly of it, but they never really achieved the kind of acclaim that they should have. But they basically came up they didn't come up with it. Kaminer and Freud came up with the idea of the blocking factors, I'd say, but they developed it in a more modern scientific sense. So we have a timeline here. Um, I got this off of a website, uh, basically giving all kinds of scientific uh, advances. And these were some of the advances that they had at that website. Lloyd Old providing the first evidence of immune systems ability to prevent cancer, 1959, and it, it, it took a mere 31 years for the FDA to finally approve BCG, particularly for bladder cancer. Then about a decade later, the Hellstroms first observed serum from mice with tumors blocked the reaction of lymphocytes, almost identical to what uh, Freund and Kaminer had seen in, in a cruder way in the, you know, their testing in Vienna in the, in the uh, 
15 years of the 20th century. And then in 75, they list Old, Old and Company, Old and his team's discovery of tumor necrosis factor, which we talked about. And in 82, Jim Allison, who will figure large, loom large in this story, he first used monoclonal antibodies, which are kind of guided missiles within the immune system, to make a description of tumor-specific antigens and a mouse lymphoma. This was the precursor of what became immune checkpoint inhibitors, immune checkpoint blockade, whatever you want to call it. So now we come to the most famous immunologist of our day, uh, James P. Allison, PhD. Um, and I want to draw a couple of points here, by the way, um, for those who want to go into greater detail with this, I about a year and a half ago, I did a, uh, a one hour um, podcast with Jim Allison. Um, and this was in preparation for our film, uh, uh, Immunotherapy, The Battle Within, which is at our, as I said, at our website, mossreports.com. So people can look at there and if they're interested, look more about my, my questioning of him. And it's a very fascinating uh, uh, conversation. Um, but basically people know him as the head of immuno immunology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. To me, a bit more significant is the fact that he is the scientific director of Cancer Research Institute. Helen Coley North founded the Cancer Research Institute. Lloyd Old was the first and only scientific director of Cancer Research Institute. And when Lloyd got sick, he asked for, and, and they appointed Jim Allison as his successor. So there've only been two directors, scientific directors of the uh, Cancer Research Institute, Lloyd Old and Jim Allison. So even though you know other people may not see a direct link, I think there is this institutional link or this almost like DNA link between Coley and Jim Allison. Uh, these things flow, if you connect the dots, they flow one to the other. He uh, shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Tasuku Honjo in 2018, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine and what they call the prize motivation, the reason for the prize for their discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation, meaning negative in the sense that the cancer is restraining and defeating the immune system. This is what led to the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs. And Jim Allison, as an academic scientist, mostly at UC Berkeley, but also at a while at Memorial Sloan Kettering and then at MD Anderson, Jim Allison actually saw his work, his scientific work turn into a drug and not only a drug, but an entire field of cancer treatment. And I think pre-Jim pre Allison, it was unclear what would be the fourth modality in cancer. People always talked about the fourth modality, meaning surgery, radiation, chemotherapy were the three modalities of cancer. But, um, you know, tables are more stable if they have a fourth leg on them. And we thought for many years that hypothermia was going to be the fourth modality. There were a lot of different candidates. Once immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy came on the scene and Uravoy, the first of the immune checkpoint drugs, once that was approved by FDA, there was no contest anymore. So immunotherapy is the fourth modality. And look what happened in 10 years, this incredible, incredible development. Um, these are the cancers as of this, uh, of this presentation that are approved in different stages, of course, in different conditions. But basically, look at the list I mean, I don't know, that's probably 50%, 40, 50% of all the cancer types or all the cancers in the United States. Um, and they, given certain preconditions, it's not a, a blanket uh, approval for all of them. So don't be surprised if you have breast cancer, if your doctor is not too enthusiastic about immune checkpoint therapy, because there are cases where it might work and there are cases where it almost certainly won't. But that's how, how far this has come. I don't know of anything in the cancer field that moved this quickly. And the reason for it, there's a couple of reasons. So one, one reason, the scientific reason, is that 
Uh, in melanoma, which is a very serious form of skin cancer, uh, the results are pretty amazing. And between 50, in the better clinical trials, between 50 and 60% of people, even with stage four disease, can have remissions of the cancer, which appear to be quite long lasting. It takes two drugs to do that. And the risk of side effects is very high. But from that knowledge that we were now curing some stage four can cancers of adults that previously were incurable uh, has come this flood of interest and, and innovation in the field. The other reason being that these things uh, are incredibly profitable for, for big pharma companies. And I saw a, a, a document uh, where it said that um, one drug alone, Keytruda, uh, which is pembrolizumab, had uh, earned, I think it was two years ago, earned $8.8 .8 billion. And the cost per patient of these drugs is $150,000 per patient. That's the typical cost of the immune checkpoint drugs. And that, as, as uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Leonard Salt said, that's parts, not labor. In other words, that's not the bill at the end of the day that you get from, or that somebody gets from the hospital. That's just for the drug itself, just for the, for the in injection or infusion of the drug. So these, this is sort of swept the field. And the, the problem is that it still leaves a lot of people out. It leaves people out, even though FDA in a completely uh, unprecedented move approved uh, in, uh, Keytruda in particular, for any solid tumor that's not able to repair errors in its DNA. So there's a kind of what they call tissue agnostic therapy, meaning uh, it doesn't matter where the cancer occurs. If the, if the molecules line up just right, and we could discuss what that is, FDA says go for it, because it isn't about the, the anatomical origin of the disease, it's about what lies on the cell surface of the cells and how competent the person is to receive that treatment. Which brings me to my next point. Would immune checkpoint inhibitors work for you if you're a patient? Well, they studied this at, at, um, at MD Anderson, excuse me. And it was, it was interesting because they came up with certain risk factors. I'm sure they were not referencing Coley uh, or Helen Coley Nortz at any of this. I don't think so. But look at what the number one risk factor is in terms of not responding to um, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. It's having an absolute lymphocyte number under 1800, uh, 1800, 1.8K as it's uh, sometimes written on, the, on people's uh, CBC test, their complete blood count test. So it's the same thing that Helen was talking about. The initial immune competence of the patient is the largest factor. You have about uh, all other things being equal, you have about a three, three times greater chance of the treatment working if you have, uh, uh, if you're in the top 20% of the population vis-a-vis -vis the number of lymphocytes you have, at least in the circulating blood. And there are other things, performance status, and neutrophils and so forth. But the most important was how strong is, how big is your immune system and how strong is your immune system? And uh, now we'll come to our next slide, which is our last slide. And, and that is basically to remind everybody that we've, uh, we've done a film. I say we, I mean my grandson, Jacob Moss, my son, Ben Moss and I, uh, over a period of about a year and a half, we worked on this film, Immunotherapy, The Battle Within. And that goes uh, in greater detail about many of the things we talked about. And uh, Jacob went to Europe and filmed in a lot of different or some, some different uh, clinics in Europe that do immunotherapy that wouldn't be generally available in the United States. Um, but it shows the continuity of all these ideas that we're talking about, as well as doctors in the United States who are using immunotherapy in somewhat different ways. Dr. Moss, can you hear the standing ovation of the <laughs> listener? Can you hear the applause? Oh, yeah. Thank I you. Hope, I hope we can have you back on so many different topics that we didn't get to cover today. Um, there are a few questions. 
It's been 50 years since Nixon declared the war on cancer. What progress has been made in conquering cancer and where, in addition to the immunotherapy, is that coming from? It's a great question. And, you know, for a while, I, every time there was an anniversary, a five-year or 10-year, I had a, a, a close friend and colleague named Sam Epstein, who was a a uh, professor at University of Illinois and a brilliant, a brilliant epidemiologist and uh, student of environmental cancer. And he and I would write op-eds uh, at that time, sort of bewailing the lack of progress in the cancer field. And I know that um, as this 50th anniversary rolls around, it's, it's, uh, tech, it's actually December 23rd of 2021 will be the 50th anniversary of Nixon declaring the war on cancer. There are going to be a lot of voices raised to say uh, they failed. They didn't do it. They failed. I know, especially within the alternative field and then within the conventional field already, the NCI at their website is celebrating the 50th anniversary and saying, you know, nothing can stop us, et cetera, et cetera. So, not wanting to, you know, being a bit of a contrarian and not wanting to associate myself with either side, I must say that, you know, the field of cancer today is, it's unrecognizable from what it was 50 years ago. And depending on the cancer you look at, a lot of the graphs of, I have to accept the figures as they're presented by the SEER uh, which is the uh, surveillance and epidemiology branch of the NCI. But you look, go in at their website, the NCI, which is cancer.gov, and look at the survival charts on many kinds of cancer. They are going down. They're not going down as fast as we want them to. And there are still some cancers that where they're increasing for reasons we don't understand. But as a general rule, you know, the crisis of this rapidly rising uh, numbers of cancer is sort of under control. And some of that, a lot of that has to do with the campaign against tobacco and, to and smoking. And some of it has to do with the um, lifestyle modifications, uh, people exercising more, people being, you know, there's a certain portion of the population, let's say a goodly portion that's caught on to that and the, and the influence of diet and, and uh, exercise and activity and so forth. So I think we're healthier, or at least a, a good portion of the population is healthier. And we're seeing that reflected in decreasing rates of cancer. And while we can't give the NCI all the credit for that, you know, there's some effectiveness to the establishment point of view. Now that said, it's still very, uns the picture is very unsatisfying to me because we're sort of like stuck at, I would say, a plateau. And if we just project out those things, we're you know, those rates, even if you could keep it going down and there's no guarantee that we can, um, it's still going to be, this disease is going to be with us for, you know, for hundreds of years. So we didn't have the knockout blow to cancer. Um, and that's the government's fault that, that they, oversold the cancer war. In se uh, some people watching might remember that in, in 71, there were ads and big columns and stuff in the newspapers saying, we're gonna cure cancer in time for the bicentennial. So, well, the bicentennial wasn't, wasn't even five years away. I came on board at Sloan Kettering in 74 and it felt as if the war on cancer had just begun. It was almost not, you know, it was just gearing up at that, yeah, to hire people and so forth. So um, how are you going to cure it in, not by time for the bicentennial? And we had a great, you know, a great um, a display of ships and uh, op sail or whatever they called it in New York Harbor, but no, no cure for cancer and no cure for cancer ever materialized. And what we had were a series of really pathetic um, false starts, uh, false claims, people exploiting the cancer situation for the money, people exploiting it for to get political uh, gain. And we, it's a story I tell in my, in my book, Cancer Incorporated, which is available, by the way, at my website, available for, for free for people who would like to download the, the, uh, e the PDF version of it. But there's a long history of 
of uh, the cure du jour, you know, of selling cures to people without really uh, looking into it uh, scientifically. So I think, you know, we've had a, a long and sorry history, but I wouldn't go back to where we were in 1971, much less in 1974. None of these discoveries in immunotherapy that Jim Allison and the others made uh, could have been made without modern scientific uh, techniques um, into monoclonal antibodies and these other things that we mentioned. So science moved on and a lot of that science was developed within the orbit of cancer science because that partially because that's where the money was. So what, what looked like uh, cancer research was actually basic biological research. But I think, you know, we, we have to now extend the immunology portion, the immunotherapy portion of this. And I think part of the key to that is those, those factors that Helen coley Notes identified and also that uh, Jim Allison's team at MD Anderson identified, which is how do you strengthen the person's own immune system? And what, what is affecting that immune system? And these are, you know, these are mysterious things unless we research them. Uh, are there supplements, for instance, that could boost the immune system? I believe there are, at least the scientific studies do. We still need the, you know, a lot of clinical studies on this, but I think that's key because if a person is their immune system is lacking or lagging, um, the logical thing to do would be give them some medicinal mushrooms to boost up the number of lymphocytes or give them Chinese herbs to boost up the lymphocytes. So that's an area we could explore. The other big things, in my opinion, would be metabolic therapies, meaning going back and accepting and understand, better understanding the whole Warburg effect, meaning the, the peculiarity of cancer in that it's extremely avid for sugar, avid for glucose. And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the average person, the, the person's diet or the diet of a cancer patient and so forth? I was very encouraged to see uh, a big laboratory opening at Princeton University just recently just to explore those questions. And, um, and then I also would, don't think that they've adequately explored the topic of cancer stem cells because cancer stem cells by all the scientific accounts are you know, the, are the driving force within the tumor. It's a small minority of cells that can have the effect of spreading the cancer and being very aggressive and doing everything bad that we're afraid of when it comes to cancer. How do you kill or control cancer stem cells? Well, there's a lot of research going on, mostly outside the United States on this topic. And a lot of natural agents are, turn out food factors uh, for, turn out to have... Um, anti-cancer, not just anti-cancer potential, because that's been known for decades, but anti-cancer stem cell potential. So this is like another area that it's sort of like where the Coley's, you know, where the immunotherapy was, I don't know, like in the 1950s or 60s. It's, it's there, this, or, this, or even in the 1990s. I mean, the science is, is there and it's building and it's accumulating, but the breakthrough has to be the clinical tests, the clinical trials. They have to be well-designed and designed by a person like a Lloyd Old who is sympathetic to what the people who use those things are trying to achieve. Because if you go after it uh, from a completely skeptical uh, point of view, it's easy to arrange negative tests. It isn't hard. Anybody could you know, do that. So you have to come at it from a, from a somewhat with an open mind, or at least, or, you know, if not a sympathetic uh, mind. And then you might be able to say, yeah, we could kill cancer stem cells with this combination of nutritional factors. Or maybe each individual is somewhat, each cancer is somewhat unique in terms of what the drivers of the uh, cancer stem cells are. So you design an individualized program. And this is happening, but it's mostly not happening in the United States. It's a disconnect between the vast amount of excellent scientific work being done on cancer stem cells and the almost complete lack of clinical trials uh, to, to try to uh, control cancer in that way.
That was an outstanding explanation and obviously the landing point for your next presentation here. Okay, I'll be here. Let's, uh, thank you. Let, let us stay with this for a moment. We have a comment from our listeners about vitamin D and the American Cancer Society. Basically, apparently they said uh, that there remains considerable uncertainty about cancer prevention with supplementary vitamin D. Uh, would, you, are you, would you like well, to? I think I always suggest to people that they have blood tests done of their vitamin D levels. I don't think it will, I think we're past the age of sort of willy nilly throwing things at the cancer and just hoping something's going to stick. I think, you know, let's approach it scientifically. Now, if the person, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D. Um, you can see from my complexion, I've been indoors for you know, the last six months uh, up in, in Maine here, not too many opportunities to get out in the, into the, uh, the great outdoors. So some people, you know, are going to have sufficient amount of vitamin D um, and many others won't. And it's not healthy. It's not good to not have exposure to sunlight at all. And of course, the use of sun blockers, which people do because most much because of fear of skin cancers like melanomas, it may, it's understandable, but then maybe you're deficient in vitamin D. So you have to have a holistic doctor or a naturopathic uh, physician uh, test you, test your blood to see if you're deficient. Um, and if you are, to me, it makes perfect sense then to supplement somebody to be in the optimum, optimal range. I don't think it's enough just to find yourself in a very broad category of what's normal or not. But this takes expertise. And a lot, you know, a lot of naturopathic doctors today are, it's not, it's not the natur naturopathy of old. I mean, these are people who are very sophisticated in their understanding of biochemistry and of how to correct deficiencies in patients and not just make them proficient, but also make, make them optimal, which is a word we should hear more of when we talk to our doctors. It seems that one of Helen Coley's basic tenets, as well as the immunotherapy um, medical field, addresses one's inherent strength and immune system. Uh, I'd like to make a personal comment because this is how I became involved in the whole cancer arena and as a cancer consultant. In 2006, I had the first episode of cancer. My oncologist actually fired me because he wanted me to do something, and I thought, and this is where, you know, I think your work is so important because you're supporting the individual, right? You are supporting them with information. So I said, my immune system is already screaming for help. Why would I do what you're suggesting I do? And he hung up the phone and he fired me. Mm -hmm. um, I did five days of radiation back then, which frankly, I'd never do again. And they said, no antioxidants and no exercise. And I thought, that makes no sense. I'm dealing with my own immune system. So your immunotherapy information and the broad range of that is so important. So I exercised two hours a day walking and I took my blueberries and I'm here seven cancers later as a cancer consultant, you know, healthy and strong. So it, it addresses the point of, you know, how did Helen Coley manage to set up her foundation when there was so much resistance in the industry and how did that happen? Because we still have resistance in the industry and there's still good information, as you pointed out, outside the United States on how we support ourselves. Yeah. Well, she was, uh, she was, you know, uh, basically kind of blackballed, but you see, she wasn't a doctor. So because she wasn't a doctor, um, there wasn't any way very easy way for them to censure her or control her. Um, she was basically just a lay person in the field. And she then had that connection with Sloan Kettering and uh, her, a lot of the funding of her, of Cancer Research Institute went right over to Sloan Kettering. And Sloan Kettering became through Lloyd Old. It was Lloyd Old, you know, you need, you need a key opinion leader within the field to advocate for your position. Until you have that KOL, as they call them, who will advocate and be a strong voice and will take the brunt of the attacks that are inevitably going to come, you can't really break through at the professional level. 
that person or per, or, P, or or could be a number of people have to be very smart and very very courageous and persuasive um, everything fell into place for Helen and Lloyd in the end Lloyd was appointed head of the Ludwig uh, Foundation for cancer research for their scientific work so he had behind him the man who in 1982 Forbes says was, was the richest individual in the United States Ludwig um, who was an American shipping magnate and owned properties and stuff all over the world was so fabulously wealthy and no one ever heard of him <clears throat> because he was he, he was completely publicity shy I don't think he gave an interview after the 1950s so no one ever heard of him but he had vast wealth like a Howard Hughes or a or a you know William Randolph Hearst type of guy he owned everything he had stuff all over the world and he was equally fanatically interested in the cancer field from 71 on. And he picked, out of everybody that he could have picked, he picked Lloyd Old to head his scientific, you know, these guys found each other, if you know what I mean. And at Lloyd's um, uh, um, memorial service, which was held at Memorial Sloan Kettering in the beginning of 2012, he died in 2011. But I heard, I heard, um, Somebody, I think it was uh, Stephen Rosenberg of National Cancer Institute, said Lloyd Old seeded the field with two hundred million dollars in research money and over a thousand or and two and and a thousand researchers. So, how could he do that? Well, it wasn't Sloan Kettering money; it was Ludwig's money that did that. So, you know, this since we live in a capitalist society, you know, you have to have those wealthy and powerful individuals behind you, because otherwise, if you just leave it up to NCI, and I'm a big fan of NCI, but if you leave it up to them and you don't have that power behind you, so you need, you need the Helens of the world, you need the Lloyds of the world, you need the Ludwigs of the world, and that combination was turned out to be unstoppable. And then you also need the Jim Allisons of the world who came up, among other things, with something that could make 8.8 billion dollars a year for a single drug. I mean, it, it, it became irresistible. The question is how it didn't happen even sooner, but everything had to mature and had to sort of fall into place. And, you know, that was what, that's how it went. And we need the Ben, the Dr. Mosses of the world and your entire family supporting your work. So you know, family is important. Right. We need uh, everything. We need to know what's going on in Europe. I have one more quick question mm -hmm. from the audience before I close the program. The question is, why is that surveillance can detect ovarian cancer recurrence, but survival is still not improved? And I know that's a big question, and I'm sorry you have a little time to answer it. Great question. Yeah. Um, surveillance is still important, but, you know... It's, it's one of the strangest things that the most sensitive test for cancer that I ever came across, the test that I believe say, helped save my life when I uh, disappeared without a trace, Uncle Blot, Uncle Blot, the Jim, Jim Moray and his, and, uh, and his wife uh, discovered at Purdue University and that I took six years ago and it detected my own prostate cancer for me. Um, and many other people also had their lives saved by this. That when Jim died and his wife died uh, the following year, the, the people who inherited the, the test basically turned it over to somebody to make, try to make more money uh, from it, to put it bluntly. And the thing disappeared without a trace, even though it had been publicized, it had been, it had been published scientifically. There was a whole, you know, interest in this. So, you know, stuff happens. And, you know, Shakespeare said, who can look into this, I paraphrase, who could look into the seeds of time and say which will grow and which will not? I mean, so we don't know. Some things just fall by the wayside and they could be really good things like, like uh, happened time and again with this erysipelas discovery, right? Uh, other things, it clicks and you've got the, you've got what you need. And as I said, if you could put together that team, even if they're not working in the same room, but 
working towards the same goal, the, the, the um, scientists, the publicists, the funders, maybe the government people working behind the scenes, you've got a good chance of succeeding. What, you, what the hardest part to get around is the, the uh, modern conditions with big pharma dominating the cancer field, like so many other fields, nine companies basically control production of drugs in the cancer field. And you don't have to get conspiratorial about this. They may not give a darn about any of these so-called alternative or complementary treatments. All they have to do is aggressively pursue their own self-interest. And that crowds out everything else that might occupy that same space. So I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's just, there, it's just the way that the world works, the way it operates. So you have to come up with a, you have to have a powerful, dedicated team. And every one of those parts of that team have to be really outstanding, really excellent. If you don't have that total picture, it's not going to work. You can have a brilliant scientist and a brilliant publicist. You don't have the funding to pursue this and to make this work. And, and some of it is just like the zeitgeist. Some of it just has to, uh, you know, has to be, the time has to be right for it. So the time was right for immunotherapy. Uh, the public was sufficiently primed for that discovery to happen. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. That, that would be absolutely brilliant because there's no question that we have incredible medical professionals out there with huge caring hearts who are not getting the full picture on the studies when they do a lot of the recommendations. And there's no question that there's a huge financial profit um, in, in the whole pharma industry. And this is all an, another topic which is really important because we need what we need when we need it. And we start with the body and its own immune system and we're not getting... That, that basic information. Um, Dr. Moss, this was absolutely incredible. I'm going to close the program now. And I, I do hope you heard that standing ovation. I want to thank our AV team because we went from in-person programming to virtual program, and they've been working 24 seven for so long. And fortunately, you know, something, there's always a silver lining, right? We're gonna continue to have our virtual programming as well as our in-person programming as soon as we can have in-person programming. Um, I want to remind everyone about uh, the Dr. Moss's website, his reports. Dr. Moss, your website name again, please. Moss Reports. Dot com. And we also have, we have a podcast, The Moss Report, which right. is available through all the usual ways people get their podcasts. And right. our inter in-depth interviews with people I consider to be very, very interesting figures in the field. Well, you are modest. You manage to, uh, you know, get the best people to interview, to give out information that's hard to find. And that has been part of the mission of um, my mission through the Commonwealth Club support to bring people in like Tom Seafried, metabolic disease, Kelly Turner, all of these can be found as yours will on the website. I encourage everyone who receives the link to today's program to go to Dr. Moss's website, to get his book at a discount. There's a discount code there to share this interview widely with everyone you know, because we have to empower people when they're in the fear zone of cancer, there must be hope. And that hope comes from actual positive working with their immune system. And that starts with information. And Dr. Moss provides information through his books, through his free films, free films, you know, through, through so much. So please take advantage of that. Um, once again, we have incredible programs here through the Health and Medicine Committee. There's an upcoming program called Healthy Society, Health Equity 101. It'll explore the concept of health equity that, go, that goes beyond you know, religion goes beyond color, goes beyond everything. It's about transforming our nation with health equity for everyone. So I encourage you to look online. That program's on June 8th. I also encourage you to give the gift of membership of the Commonwealth Club. The camaraderie that comes from discussing a program amongst yourselves, like Dr. Moss's program, like all the other programs that we offer in every field you can possibly think about. And the membership is somewhere, depending, you know, what did I say, five or six movie tickets in traditional world? So once again, you are invited to join us in this unbiased forum where we bring the experts in all fields here without judgment. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Moss, you're absolutely incredible. And 
I am so grateful you're here. <laughs>